Hello. Many argue the West is in decline, and some go further, arguing that the Asian age has already begun. But US politics is what dominates the media. So in the West, are we in denial? Do Americans and Europeans cling to the idea of Western dominance, fearing the reality of a radically different future? Or is that story about the end of the West a bit overdone? Is it time to recognize that it's just not that important who the US president is or what American policy is in the world? And should we be focusing on China and its recently announced five-year plan to triple GDP by 2035? Or its civil military strategy to use technological advances to strengthen its power, economic and military? Or is the US still really the most influential country in the world? And in practice, will it remain so for decades to come? Well, we're going to explore those issues tonight as we get real about global power. My name is Rana Mitter. I teach Chinese politics and history at Oxford University. And I've got a fantastic panel for you tonight to debate these issues. First of all, Michael Pembroke, who is a former New South Wales Supreme Court judge and author of a new book, America in Retreat, The Decline of U.S. Leadership from World War II to COVID-19. Then we have Cindy Yu, who's a China reporter and broadcast editor at The Spectator magazine as well as host of the magazine's Chinese Whispers podcast, which I highly recommend. Then we have Melissa Chan, who is an American broadcast journalist, reporter, and collaborator with the Global Reporting Center, as well as a frequent presenter for DW News Asia. And she's worked for several news outlets, including ABC News and Al Jazeera, where she reported from, uh, with which she reported from Beijing uh, until 2012. And last, but very much not least, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, former conservative MP, former Secretary of State for Defense and Foreign Secretary, one of many prestigious cabinet positions that he's held. And in fact, he's one of only five members of parliament to have served throughout the whole 18 years of the governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major. Well, we're gonna to move to the debate in just a minute or two, but first of all, I'd like to hear from each of my guests tonight and get them to just give us a couple of minutes of thought on the big question of whether we are clinging to the idea of Western dominance because we fear the reality of a very radically different future. Michael Pembroke, could I start with you? Well, thank you, Rana. I, I do think most of us cling to the idea of Western dominance, uh, and that's because we've become accustomed to it. And fear of the unknown is a natural human phenomenon. On the other hand, self-deception is easy, but realism requires courage. I think there's also a considerable degree of Western cultural insecurity about Asia, and in particular about China. The reality is that Western dominance is an historical aberration. In 1820, for example, China and India still represented half of the world's GDP. It's often said that for 18 of the last 20 centuries, China's economy was the largest in the world. Today, Western economic dominance is ebbing away. It's largely a question of scale. The E7 nations have surpassed the G7 in contribution to global growth. The population of Asia is four and a half billion people, of which China represents merely a third. And China's population is more than four times that of the United States and more than double that of the West consisting of the UK, uh, Western Europe, North America, Australia, and New Zealand. And Western credibility and respect have also diminished, largely and unfortunately due to the actions of the United States. Following the end of the Cold War in 1991, its hubris and unilateralism significantly increased. In 2001, it commenced its suicidal wars and in 2020, its dysfunction and inequality have been painfully apparent. In the meantime, China has achieved effective primacy in the Western Pacific and probably in most of Eurasia. It all reminds me of George Orwell, who once said, to see what is in front of one's nose requires constant attention. Thanks very much indeed, Michael. Very concise and very much to the point. And on that question, Melissa, could we have your thoughts? Well, 
I think it depends on what you mean by Western. Uh, Western tends to be a shorthand for democracy. And if that's the case, there's certainly been a lot of angst uh, over the last few years about the democracy's retreat in many places around the world. I mean, the chipping away of democratic norms in the US attracting probably uh, the greatest amount of attention. Uh, although I'd be quick to point out that some of the most vibrant, robust, robust democracies are in Asia. Uh, democracy such as Taiwan, which has become a model of good governance uh, in terms of how it's dealt with the pandemic in 2020. But also I think of South Korea. Just a few years ago, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets, a fantastic demonstration of civil society and protest culture, and they brought down a president. Uh, we also, of course, have seen months of protests in Thailand, and how can we forget the perseverance of the people of Hong Kong? So if we're talking about the West in terms of the political system that birthed uh, in the West, I would say that democracy, there are certainly a lot of questions uh, about its robustness, but in many ways it remains strong. Now, if by the West you mean the geopolitical order that is led by the United States, it gets a little trickier. And um, I would say that people have been slow on the uptake when it comes to recognizing a rising techno-authoritarian state that is China, a single party state led by a man who has designated himself leader for life, uh, a place that has the modernity of Beijing and Shanghai and its skyscrapers and its capitalism combined with the police state in Western China where we have seen hundreds of detention centers and camps that have by the UN's own estimate held some 1 million ethnic minorities. And the fact that the international community doesn't seem to be able to make China budge on this or make China do much in terms of Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, so on, um, really does perhaps suggest that we are shifting from a rules-based international order to a more multipolar world uh, where there are countries with uh, regional geopolitical spheres of influence, such as China in Asia. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Melissa, and again, very clearly, uh, clearly put. So on this question of whether the idea of Western dominance is something we are clinging to because we're worried about what the alternative might be rather than it being a realistic view of where the world is. And Malcolm Rifkin, you have seen a tremendous amount of the world over the decades from some very distinguished positions. What's your thought? Well, I agree with much of what my two colleagues have said, but I think one has to start with a very careful distinction. Are we talking about absolute decline or are we talking about relative decline? Because they're very, very different. The usual starting point is 1945, when the United States uh, had something like 70% of global GDP. But of course, the reason it had 70% was because Europe was devastated by the Second World War, and Asia, Africa, Latin America had not begun the transformation of their economic and social uh, development. Today, the United States and Europe are infinitely richer than they were in 1945. Their economic strength is much greater. Their military capability is dramatically greater. Their cultural strength is very, very uh, important, very, very strong, because uh, the Western culture, rightly or wrongly, uh, still is the culture in many respects, which has been adopted in Latin America, in Africa, and in much of Asia, including some of our political values, as has been mentioned in the, in the thriving democracies like Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, and, and South Korea, for example. Uh, so when uh, Xi Jinping, as Chinese leader, says these are, are not uh, anything other than European values, that's rubbish. I mean, that's rather like saying you can only be a Muslim if you live in the Middle East, because that's where Islam began, or Christianity began, for that matter. Uh, final point I would make is, yes, of course, in relative terms, uh, you, the United States, Western Europe, will not be as important, aren't as important today, and that will continue to change, not just as Asia develops, but wait for Latin America, wait for Africa as well. The whole world is becoming more equal. It won't be entirely equal, uh, but quite rightly and very attractively, all the nations of the world uh, are becoming modern economies with all that that implies. And the final point I make is, of course, China has a huge problem if it seeks to, if it seeks to dominate both Asia and the wider world, because uh, it has a culture and it has a language uh, which are not shared by anyone else. It doesn't have an ideology like the old Soviet Union had, 
which appealed to many millions of people in other parts of the world. It has nationalism, Chinese nationalism, which has so upset all its neighbors uh, that they look to the United States for security. That's its Asian neighbors. Uh, once, you, once you start losing the, the actual um, support of the countries of your own region and turn them into enemies, uh, then a question mark arises as to whether that's a very wise strategy. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Malcolm. And let me turn finally in this section to Cindy Yu. Cindy, you grew up in China, but you've been living in the UK and therefore, I guess, the West for quite some time. You have a you know, pretty distinctive perspective on, on both. Do you think that we are clinging to the idea of the West being dominant because we can't really wake up and smell the baijiu, as they would call it? <laughs> to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.